we now have our answer about when the peak of hurricane season will ramp up. That time is now. And as to the question of whether Dorian is a serious threat to the continental United States, it is. From Florida to the Carolinas, take preliminary action now, both near the coast and inland, for both winds and water of what could be a major hurricane. Find out today if you live in or are visiting an evacuation zone, know what county you're in, and determine where you'd shelter during the storm. Buy critical supplies now, before the inevitable rush when watches and warnings go up. Don't wait until the last minute to find out if it's definitely coming your way, because then it could be more expensive, more difficult, even impossible to do everything necessary for you to survive the storm and a potentially long and unpleasant aftermath. Keep updated every day with us here on the Weather Channel, because we must expect the unexpected to stay ahead of Dorian and stay safe. Good Wednesday afternoon. It is August 28th, 2019, and we have a big update for you today. An increase in intensity has pushed Dorian to hurricane status, a category one hurricane as of the two o'clock advisory from the National Hurricane Center. Here's a look at satellite imagery of the Atlantic Basin. We have two systems out there right now. Tropical Depression Aaron spinning hundreds of miles off the eastern seaboard, barely moving, but it will start getting off to the north there, but then we have tropical storm or now, excuse me, Hurricane Dorian that moved just to the east of Puerto Rico. Its center did, sparing the island the worst of the effects. Still have some heavy rain on the way there, but the strongest of the winds have really been isolated and centered on the uh, U.S. and British Virgin Islands over the past couple of hours. Here's the data or the stats on the system right now. Winds up to 75 miles per hour. You need 74 mile per hour winds or greater to be considered a category one storm. With those gusts up to 90 miles per hour. This upgrade is uh, right from some missions that were conducted by the uh, Hurricane Hunter aircraft that just uh, picked up some winds of over 80 miles per hour. So that's why they upgraded the system there. It's moving at the northwest at around 13 miles per hour. Here's a closer look of some of the wind observations down through the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. Some wind gusts up and over hurricane or excuse me, tropical storm force in the last couple of hours here. On top of that, I put the radar and in the last frame, you can see the center of Dorian here moving off just to the west of St. Thomas here that clocked some wind speeds up and over 45 to even 50 miles per hour as it did so on that uh, eastern side of that center. If you go over to Puerto Rico, some of the wind gusts here, not as strong, thankfully, up to around 25, 30 miles per hour, a little bit stronger the farther uh, east you go and closer to that center that you can see there. But overall, it's just going to be a rain event for Puerto Rico, which in and of itself isn't great news because all that tree loss from Hurricane Maria two years ago could cause some mudslides in that general area. We're picking up the San Juan Puerto Rico radar here. That is the same radar site that was completely obliterated by Maria as it moved on through there. Of course, it's up and operational now and picking up on the system here with plenty of tropical downpours and lots and lots of rain through the U.S. and British Virgin Islands there as it moves off towards the north and the west. Here's a look at the forecast models in terms of rainfall uh, for the next 24 hours or so. Again, not a ton of rain, but especially the southward facing slopes here, anywhere from two to six inches of rainfall is possible within the next day or so as it lifts away and away from the islands there. Overall, the cloud deck, the size of Dorian has been expanding up to around nearly 400 miles in diameter. And we expect it as it gains latitude to kind of spread out a little bit more. Its wind field, however, is still quite Quite small tropical storm force winds are only extending out less than 50 miles from the center there and that should expand too as it moves out and strengthens a little bit further overall it has been kind of evading all of the hostilities in the environment for the past several days in its lifetime so far all that's ahead of this system is much more ideal environmental conditions as it gets into the southwest Atlantic and into the Bahamas. All the dry air that's been encircling the system will actually be replaced with more moist mid-levels, which will actually help aid in the strengthening of Dorian in the coming days. Ideal environment ahead, as I said, we have pretty much every you know category checked off here. Low wind shear, down to five to 10 knots, very, very low. That allows the thunderstorm structure to develop and grow vertically. Very warm sea surface temperatures. You need 80 degree waters or warmer. We have that certainly 84 to 86 on its projected path off to the north and west. High ocean heat content. I'm gonna get into that a little bit more when I show you the map. And also the mid-level moisture. We're gonna have more, less dry air around in the coming days. First, we'll start off with that lowering wind shear. As it moves on off towards the north and west in the coming days, it's going to encounter 
very low amounts of that all the way through uh, the southwestern Atlantic and in north of the Bahamas as it continues on its strengthening trend in those coming days. Sea surface temperatures, too, you can see here that's not a problem at all. In fact, there's not even any cooler waters anywhere near this projected track, 84 to 86 degree water temperatures. Now, that's just the skin of the ocean, what you find about 10 meters down, the 84 to 86. You need those that warm water to extend down to a depth, and that's the ocean heat content here. The deeper that heat, the more energy that's available, and when storms move over the ocean, they cause it to be stirred up, upwelling, and when that happens, it tends to pull up cooler waters from the depth and replace the warm water at the surface, and eventually kind of quiets down the storm and weakens it. When you have that warm water extending down to a depth and upwelling occurs, you're just replacing warm water with warm water, and that's what we have on that projected path there. The satellite imagery showing that moist mid-level atmosphere here as it moves into the area north of the Bahamas and the southwestern Atlantic. Certainly not as many shades of yellow and rust color that we saw pretty much out in the middle parts of the Atlantic when it first developed. Much more moist atmosphere ahead. This also helps to favor something called rapid intensification. I'm sure we will see this in the coming days as it heads into those warm waters and the better conditions for it to develop. According to the National Hurricane Center, the definition of rapid intensification is an increase in the maximum sustained winds of at least 30 knots or 34 miles per hour in under a day. We've seen this happen numerous times. In fact, almost every single storm back in 2017 did that at, at some point in its lifespan. Here's how it looks on visible satellite imagery. You look at this, it certainly looks like a hurricane. It is feathering of the cirrus clouds along it. That's the outflow. Very healthy for it to breathe. Inflow coming in out of the south here, not pulling in as much dry air. We're not seeing the dry air intrusion like we saw yesterday. And it is starting to kind of warm and dry out a center and eye, especially after it moves away from the uh, Virgin Islands there, any land interaction. And it's over the open waters of the uh, southwestern Atlantic. We'll probably see that eye warm and clear on out. Watches and warnings out there. There's not a ton right now, but for Puerto Rico, a tropical storm warning is up for the island. The surrounding waters in the U.S., British Virgin Islands are under a hurricane warning here. But as this lifts away, these will likely be discontinued later on tonight. A broader look at the Bahamas and most of the rest of the Caribbean. No other watches or warnings out there just yet. That won't last. Hurricane Hunter aircraft has pretty much been in this system at some capacity, multiple aircraft at times for the last several days in the most recent mission, which prompted the upgrade to a Category 1 hurricane, uh, found winds of 81 miles per hour and a surface pressure around 1,000. They extrapolated that and got around a pressure of 997, which gives us an indication that it is actually strengthening, even though it's interacting with some of the islands there. So here is the official track from the National Hurricane Center. The track gets updated at 11 a.m. and then will be again at 5 p.m. this evening. So this is the in-between, but it does forecast our first major hurricane of the 2019 season as it moves more northwest west and then takes more of a westerly trajectory towards the east coast of Florida. If in fact it is a major hurricane at this point in time and makes landfall on the east coast of Florida, it will be the first time a category two or greater hurricane has made landfall on the east coast of Florida since Jean in 2004. So it's been 15 years and this could be in the record books if that does occur. A lot of folks have been asking why it takes that left hand turn and heads towards the east coast of the United States. It has to do with the overall steering going on in the atmosphere and we're watching a ridge that will be developing off to the north of the system. Yet to be determined how strong this ridge is but there are two possibilities here. It can either be a weaker ridge which would open up a possibility for it to take a turn more northerly and escape and possibly put in jeopardy more of the mid-Atlantic and southeastern parts of the United States. If the ridge is just a little bit stronger, a little more broad, this will push it farther off to the west into that east coast of Florida like a lot of the models were indicating and potentially surviving and heading back over in open waters of the Gulf of Mexico and making a secondary landfall somewhere along the Gulf Coast. Both are possibilities and both are indicated by some of the models. I want to show you one issue that we've been having with some of the computer models so far. This was really plaguing the models early yesterday before they got a better handle on where the center of Dorian was actually located. Here's a lot of our hurricane models. Notice they all start the initialization where they think the center of Dorian is not actually where it is. Most of these are off to the south and west, so that initialization error throws off the whole model. Only a few of these are actually picking up on exactly where Dorian is at the time these models were run. As these go out further in time, they start to diverge a little bit. The farther we get out into the future, 
they start to disagree a little bit more. That's why our cone of uncertainty grows in size the farther out you go into the future to account for this uncertainty. Some take it off to the north, that weaker ridge we just talked about. Some take it into Florida and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. That stronger ridge, that's also a possibility. So all the areas in the yellow here, Gulf Coast states, southeastern parts of the United States should also keep a mon monitor on this forecast because those models could be right. Some of them could verify. So this cone is only going to grow a little bit more as it goes farther out into time here. And this should definitely uh, be monitored. Here's how the two global models are seeing things, the European and the GFS. The red lines, I know this is going to be hard to kind of concentrate on. Any red line is the European. Any yellow line is the GFS. There has been remarkable consistency in the location of the center of Dorian from these two models. It's just what varies is the intensity. That's always the tough part with tropical systems here. Moves off to the north of Puerto Rico, heads into the warm waters, ideal environment here. They start to show strengthening. Notice when the lines are really close together, that indicates a stronger, deeper system, the European, well on board with that. As we go farther out into time, Friday evening at 9 p.m., Labor Day weekend getting underway. We're still hundreds of miles off the coast of Florida here, north of the Bahamas. Both models show a strong system heading towards the coast of Florida. The differences start here. By Sunday around the lunch hour, the GFS starts to slow the system down and kind of meander it along the coastline a little bit farther to the north here. Meanwhile, the European makes it having landfall as a major hurricane in the southern parts of Florida and then possibly even emerging back out into the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a lot still up in the air here. Nothing is written in stone. Something that you should do, keep checking back on this YouTube page. We have videos coming out pretty much every couple of hours with any updates. If you have any questions in between, you can always find me on social media, meteorologist Tim Pandagis, and on Twitter at 13 Tim Pandagis. Look right here. You can see some of that convection right around this center indicating that, you know, we've got a very powerful storm here. Even well away from it, you can see some of these rain bands coming out of this storm. So getting stronger and stronger with time. A little bit, a little bit of shear. Um, Eric, we're going to talk to Eric here in a little bit, was kind of noticing some of these clouds coming up from, from the south. And, and really, if you think about it, that's probably an indicator. A little bit of shear going on. Not enough to to hurt the storm, but kind of preventing some of that strengthening during the, the day today. However, with time, you know, we have a lot of warm water. We will probably interact with the, the Bahamas with time, but not a lot of interaction with terrain before we get to the Bahamas, and that shear goes away. So really, we're continuing to think in this forecast, um, strengthening. One of the bigger differences, I think, from the last time we did this, we are forecasting the potential of a Category 4 storm, 130 miles an hour by the time we make landfall in, in Florida. So you think about this cone. So we have strengthening. Let's look at the timing. A couple things I really need to point out here. One is the cone basically means we can expect this center anywhere in that cone two-thirds of the time based on the last five years of our forecast error when it comes to uh, the track. So anywhere in this area at the current time because it's the extended forecast could see the center. The other really important thing is we've done this on, on previous hurricanes and previous storms. We look at the distance between some of these circles. This is the other change. So one change, a uh, stronger storm by the time we get to the, the Florida coastline. Here's the other change. The other one is look at the distance between uh, those points. That right there is 24 hours. So 2 p.m. Monday to 2 p.m. Tuesday, this could change. This could change. It's called the long track error. So this could actually change with time. That's slow. That's a pretty slow movement. Slow is never our friend. So what that means is you'll have a longer period of time where you can get some of those hurricane force winds, a longer period of time that, that you can get um, the rainfall, uh, torrential rainfall, and and a longer period of time that you can have that onshore flow on the right hand side of that storm. So slow is never our friend. We're watching that. Um, still some uncertainty associated with this storm, but it, at this point, you know, no matter what, no matter where this track is, no matter where we move, there's still going to be impacts. There's still going to be storm surge. There's still going to be impacts from um, the rain and, and the wind. So let's look at some of the timing. That's probably one of the most uh, frequent things that, that were asked. And so the timing is this. This is the onset of tropical storm force winds. It, it, it really helps us know when to be prepared. So we really don't need to be outside when we see tropical storm force winds. It becomes too dangerous to drive. It becomes too dangerous to hold a piece of plywood. It just becomes too dangerous outside. So here's the Florida coast. Let me outline it there. And so the onset of some of these tropical storm force winds at the current forecast, it looks like late on Sunday into the evening. So what does that translate to? You really need to have everything done work on it tomorrow, you can work on it Saturday, 
maybe you have Sunday morning, but I, I try to really have things wrapped up on Saturday. Let's really have um, everything done, have your plan in place, have your houses ready, have everything that you need uh, to get through this storm. We've been talking about some of that rainfall. Here's some of the early predictions that we have. A little too early to get too exact with this rainfall, but really that, that tells us this. I mean, you start getting into the, the reds and the oranges. The oranges are about seven inches, so we have time to refine this forecast, but the reality is um, anywhere around the state, you can see some of that uh, that rainfall anywhere in that in that area there. So we're going to keep an eye on that, um, see how that changes. Really, it's a you know it's a time to really get those plans together because there's be a lot of impacts. We haven't mentioned the storm surge too much yet because we're still formulating that. We'll have all the all the details on the storm surge, especially when we start getting into the phase where we have the the watch. Um, issued. Uh, so we're going to be working on that. But the reality is the storm surge unit has been really huddling and trying to come up with some of those values. But I can tell you this. I can tell you this. We huddled today and we talked about it. A typical, a typical hurricane, Cat 4, Category 4 strength, could actually produce, historically, uh, looking at some of the data, some places could get a 10 foot or more storm surge. So a very dangerous situation. We will refine that with time as we get closer um, to the to the landfall here, but we'll start doing some of the modeling and come up with some of those values. So if you stay tuned, we'll be talking that talking much more about the storm surge threat over the next couple of days. Eric's on duty. Let's go talk to, to Eric Blake. Uh, we talked about Dan was on duty during the day. Eric's got the Eric's got the evening shift, and you know coming in here and you're you're seeing the satellite. I mean, what are some of your early takeaways with what you see with the hurricane? Sure. Well, we're starting to see. So we've been talking all day about the eyewall structure, double eyewall. So we're seeing some evidence that the inner one is trying to collapse and the outer one is trying to take over. Um, we're also getting data from the NOAA G4 around to sample the environment, and that'll hopefully make our model forecast better uh, for the nighttime forecast. So you see that in, in, in those type of changes. One thing, we got a lot of feedback on, on some of the mapping, and if you can, you know, none of this is scripted, by the way. We've had to go with the flow. So Eric, I mean, people really enjoy learning about this. Can you just explain what we do here and we try to plot the, the hurricane uh, on the track? Sure. So all these all these little points here are just data points. These, these uh, red triangles are the fixes from the plane. You have microwave fixes. You have sometimes some satellite fixes, whatever's there. Uh, and you can also look at the, uh, the gray lines here. This, those are the old forecasts. So you get an idea of where the trend's been going. Uh, you know, recently, uh, the trend has been going a little to the right, but it's been much more consistent toward Florida. Okay, Eric, yeah, I appreciate that information. And Eric's on duty tonight, keeping an eye on things. We're here 24, 24 hours a day, keeping an eye on the storm. Dennis, I'm gonna walk, walk this way and get uh, Steve and Sarah in the background, just a little bit of peek behind the scenes of what we're doing, standing here doing those uh, television interviews through the whole thing. These are the folks that make things work behind the scenes. So we appreciate Sarah. We really appreciate Steve back there. So Steve's on the phone, so we can't wave to you, but he's doing a great job. So here it is, serious situation. Um, have a few days to get ready. Um, all modes of the impacts from a hurricane are in play. The storm surge, the rain, and the wind. Uh, a few days to get ready, and the biggest thing is get the latest information. So uh, be careful paying attention just to that track. Be careful paying attention to just the landfall. Uh, no matter where this thing goes, looks like we're going to have some impacts from this hurricane starting late this weekend. In our area, 81 degrees under fair skies. Tonight, mostly clear, low 71. Winds light and variable. Saturday, partly cloudy, high 86. Winds northeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Saturday night, partly to mostly cloudy, low 69. Winds light and variable. Here's our seven-day outlook. Welcome back. We are tracking Hurricane Dorian. And even as the storm slows its pace, Floridians are lining up to get essential supplies, including groceries and gasoline. We're looking uh, live now at Lauderdale by the sea, a Category 4 storm. You're
you're seeing some of the preps on the lower right side of your screen and the current stats for this monster of a hurricane. Uh, uh, not quite a complete buzzsaw, if you will. It's not totally symmetrical yet, although that center core with the eye is, and that is what is helping to kind of tank these pressures, really rapidly intensify this storm, and uh, the wind speeds are responding to that lowering pressure and coming up dramatically. I don't think we're necessarily done with this climb to the wind speed yet either. So what we know now is that, well, let's face it, the Bahamas are closer to the storm than, say, the mainland United States. So we already have hurricane warnings up in the northern side of the Bahamas. A risk of life-threatening hurricane force winds and storm surge continues for the Florida East Coast. We know that there is that chance that it could go just off the coast or could be right on the coast still or just a little bit inland. Uh, all of these are still uh, likely possibilities. It's impossible to completely eliminate any of them. So you have to prepare for that worst case scenario of a, of a massive hurricane coming right up the coastline. And as it does so, it will be slowing down, which means all the impacts get worse. The freshwater flooding from the rain gets worse. You see this forecast. And again, these numbers for Saturday early morning, Saturday afternoon, likely underdone because we're already at 130 miles per hour. So down the road, will these numbers go up as well? We'll be looking at anything above 140 as it's knocking on the doorstep of the uh, coastline. Maybe, right? That is a, a frightening thought. But we'll have to see what happens at 11 o'clock. As for when preparations need to be done, uh, it, it has to be done before the tropical storm force winds arrive. And those winds get in by Sunday, uh, late Sunday, or really early Monday for southeast Florida. And again, if you were watching a couple of days ago, we were saying, oh, maybe Saturday, maybe early Sunday. This thing is crawling already and slowing down even further. So these numbers are getting later in time as well. You're getting the benefit of more time to prepare, uh, prepare but it also means that you have way worse impacts once the storm actually arrives. One of those impacts is the rain. You look at the forecast with the uh, operational run now of the European model going directly up the coastline. Some of the worst of the rain would then be offshore, but the wind and the coastal impacts would still be right at the coastline. And as evidenced by the USGFS, just a little wiggle in that uh, could I mean just catastrophic uh, impacts from Florida through Georgia to South Carolina. So do not see one image on social media that says it's going out to sea and stop preparing. That would be the worst thing that you could do right now. Uh, earlier tonight, we spoke to Ken Graham, the director of the National Hurricane Center, and he explained how even as the forecast models change, the threat remains real for anyone in this potential path get these ensemble forecasts we try to take all the all the different models and put those together so what happens is it nudged it a little bit towards the right a little bit towards the the east coast here but still a lot of impact so even even though we've moved the the forecast a little bit here we're still talking about a major hurricane i mean a category four by the approaches the the, the texas uh, you know the, the florida coast and you know really anybody in the gulf coast we've been talking about for a while getting ready but now we're starting to see some more indications of this turning towards the north but look at the length of time here i mean you're talking this is tuesday that's Wednesday, that's a long time to have hurricane force winds. Everybody has to really understand those, those are deterministic. That's one solution. We're using dozens and dozens of these solutions and blending those together. You can't let your guard down. We're still talking an, a very powerful hurricane, a, you know, a category four system here, you know, high winds, 140 mile an hour winds, slow movement, lots of rainfall. We still have to be prepared. Even though this shifts back and forth a little bit, there's no change in the real impacts of this system. It's still some air. Look at the cone. So two thirds of the time we can still get this center inside this cone. So anybody in these areas still has to be ready for those, these devastating impacts. Good afternoon, meteorologist Craig Setzer and CBS4 Weather Control. I know a lot of folks are busy. A lot is going on. There's a lot of anxiety uh, we're feeling here in South Florida. And uh, if you were with us two years ago for Irma in 2017, we got to a point where it felt like the tension level was so high. I literally said, and I need to say it again, everybody just take a breath, take a breath. 
and let's just try to um, relax a little bit. I know the anxiety is really, really high, and it's amazing. You go out and everybody is talking about the storm. Everybody is discussing the models, and we'll discuss the models too. But, uh, but this is not coming here tonight or tomorrow, so we have some time. So everybody, uh, we'll just just relax a little bit. And, and honestly, I'm kind of saying it for myself too. So let's show you the latest. Here's the two o'clock intermediate advisory, the intermediate advisory that's now every three hours uh, at 2 p.m. and then the next intermediate advisory will be at 8 p.m. This is just an update on the position and the location. And a couple of things I want to point out here. First uh, is the latitude there. The latitude is that 24.8 number and 24.8 is this number right up here. So that's the number that it goes up, uh, means that it's getting farther and farther north, and we want that number to keep going up and keep going up at a good clip. We want it above 26. In fact, if it's above 27, that'll be much, much farther north uh, with our latitude, and that will be a good thing. So that number we're watching. Also uh, new but not significant with this advisory is the wind speed there, 115 miles an hour. That makes it Category 3. That was in the forecast, so no surprises there. We expected that. The storm is now 445 miles or so east of the northwest Bahamas. Now here's the future track and the future track uh, continues this slow curve here. We're already in part of the turn here but now it continues it to the west and west northwest and this is our Saturday evening time frame so all of these points are slowing down just a little bit as far as how close and how quickly it gets to Florida. Here's our Sunday morning position Here's our Monday morning position there. This is the Northwest Bahamas, so uh, through the Northwest Bahamas. And then this is our Tuesday morning position. And as I mentioned earlier, that three is because that forecast points over land. It's not a weakening of the storm approaching us. It's a weakening after it gets over land. And then look what happens, and we've talked about this also. There's a sudden point change up to the north there, it's still winding down. So this turn here is showing up in all the models, but the big question mark is, does this turn occur after it gets to South Florida and then goes north? Does this turn as it reaches South Florida and then goes north? Or does this turn occur out here and then it goes north? Because many of the models are indicating that turn is going to be rather abrupt. Now obviously a faster storm gets to Florida sooner and uh, then it turns or a slower storm may not get to Florida before it turns and those are two of the considerations that we're watching. Now uh, because new model data is coming in I'd like to show it to you because uh, I'm not going to hide anything. People uh, text me and call me and they're like what, what do you know? What's the real story? I'd say tune in at three and I'll show you the real story. I'm telling you everything. I'm telling my friends, my family, uh, people here at the station what's going on. There's no, no hiding what's going on. Here's the uh, models for 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Here we go through time. There's the European model and there's the GFS model. This is 3 p.m. Monday afternoon. So you can see they're in better agreement, much better than they've been now. That's good. We like that because it increases confidence. But the main thing to note, and I'm actually going to draw this for you, is that the European model no longer has that southwest turn. This run, and in fact the last one, kind of showed more of a west or a west-northwest motion. We like that because that southwest turn, that was a scary thing to think that it could be getting higher and then come back to the south and then come up at us. This is one run now. We want to see three more of these type of runs before we start feeling better here. And the difference between where it is here and where it is there is about 100 miles, and that is too close to call. So the new model is now going ahead in time. This is 3 p.m. on Monday, going into 4 a.m. on Tuesday. The European model still has it right about there. It's basically stalled just to our east. The GFS model is a little bit more to the north now on Tuesday morning. And now watch what happens. Both models begin a northward pull. So the big question is, is are you going to buy this model? And if you do, you're taking a big risk because we've only seen one run of this model that's a little bit offshore. Or are you going to continue to prepare? I am putting up my shutters tomorrow because I'm not betting my house that this model is going to be better than this model here.
And so don't buy into one model. Don't say, oh, it's going to miss us, because we just don't know that yet. And it takes me a while to put up my shutters, and it takes me a while to top off my supplies and things like that. There may come a point in time as we go through the weekend where we say we can pause our preparations, but now is not the time for that. This is too close to call at this point. And the thing is, if you're talking about a compact Category 4, you're, you've either got windy conditions with rain or you've got a hurricane and a bad hurricane. And it's just too close to call at this point. So my message to everybody here at the station, my message to all my friends, my message to all of you, is we continue to prepare until we see a more confident resolution that this is not coming here to South Florida. I talked to a friend this morning and he said, he said, I don't think it's gonna hit, but I got gas, I got water, and I took care of my home. And I said, you did the right thing. It's great that you think it's not going to come here, but you're prepared that it will come here. And that's the way we all need to think. So we'll keep you up to date. We'll give you the latest uh, news conferences and the latest information. This is the newest run on the European model here. I'll bring it all to you and, uh, and break in as necessary. But of course, uh, we want you to be safe. We want us to be safe. We all live here in South Florida. We're all dealing with this together, okay? Hi, it's the Tropical Tidbit for Tuesday evening, September 3rd. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local officials for the best information for your location. This is, of course, going to be mostly about Dorian, but this is the peak of the hurricane season. There's a couple other areas going on. We do have Tropical Storm Fernand, newly formed in the western Gulf of Mexico. Quick look at that storm. It's a little sheared, low-level circulation right about here on the eastern edge of the deep convection on the west side. This is moving west-northwestward and is expected to be primarily a heavy rainfall threat for northern Mexico and some rain in parts of southern Texas as well. There's the forecast track from the National Hurricane Center getting this in there sometime on Wednesday and decaying over land. Again, rain, the primary threat. Tropical storm warnings for gusty winds, perhaps up to 40 miles per hour are in effect for portions of the North Mexican coastline. We also have a new tropical depression 8 in the eastern Atlantic. This is expected to stay out to sea and is no threat to land right now. Uh, so getting to the primary uh, problem here, Hurricane Dorian off the east coast of Florida. Here is the current infrared loop this evening, and we see that the storm is finally moving north-northwestward away from the northern Bahamas. Thankfully, after almost two days of sitting in there, is finally pulling away and hopefully give these guys a break and let recovery efforts uh, get in there. It, there's been some terrible pictures coming out of those islands and hopefully uh, people make it through. Uh, we are seeing this movement now as heralded and it's a little bit behind schedule about 12 hours compared to expectations a couple days ago but it is now underway and we can see that it's still distant from the Florida coastline uh, but we are starting to see some outer bands uh, begin to come on shore and bring uh, heavy rains with them. Winds have not really made it to tropical storm force yet. Gusts may be over 30 miles per hour, but not much more than that as of yet. However, the center is going to get a little bit closer to the coastline as we head into tomorrow, and we could see tropical storm force winds start occurring in this section of coastline sometime overnight tonight. You'll note a couple of characteristics on both radar and satellite imagery, and that's that we have some broken clouds in the core of the storm. We no longer have this solid ring of reds all the way around what was the eye, and we now see some of these breaks showing up periodically in the center. And if we look at the radar picture, what's really supposed to be the eye here is really embedded within this larger area that includes some dry uh, slots that are showing up in here. And this is not really ingestion of dry air from the environment at all. What it is, is sort of self-generated dry air because again, the storm when it stalled here in the northern Bahamas generated a lot of cool water underneath it. And this whole area on the southern half of the storm is quite cold probably right now. We don't have measurements, but we know that it is. And uh, that for that reason, the air that has been cooled and getting recirculated within the storm now has lower moisture and temperature content. And this is limiting thunderstorm activity as this starts to really impact the storm after the two days it's spent cooling that water. The storm is now moving northward and the water north of about 28 north here should be pretty warm but it is going to take some time for the Gulf Stream which runs in here uh, to start aiding the storm regenerating its thunderstorm activity and this will likely be a gradual process. The storm has weakened and broadened as expected when this kind of cooling happens. The recon mission in there today has found a pressure that continues to very slowly rise but 
not as fast as before, indicating that the weakening trend is probably coming to a halt as the storm regains some warm water beneath it. But we're now up to 960 millibars, and the winds that are being found strongest on the eastern side of the storm, northeast and southeastern quadrants, are about 100 miles per hour at the surface. NHC intensity as of this video is 110 miles per hour. Recon data currently supports about 100. We'll see if it comes down at the 11 p.m. advisory, but winds over 100 miles per hour still showing up in this storm. Could those winds come back up? Could the storm re-intensify as it comes into some warmer water? The answer is possibly. Now, when a storm gets this broad like this, it becomes quite difficult to uh, strengthen again because once we have this broad wind field, you can see how far these uh, purple wind barbs now extend the hurricane force wind field at flight level, the vortex has become more inertially stable, so it's more difficult to get inflow toward the center that's needed to help spin up the storm as thunderstorms redevelop, and it's more resistant to that kind of flow. And for that reason, it's difficult for broad storms to become strong and compact and tight once more. That said, it's not impossible, and we could see a period of reintensification as the storm starts moving northward tonight and tomorrow as shear will remain low and the water is warm. And if you give any storm like this enough time, it will start regaining some intensity once again. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Winds could come back up from what they are now. But intensity changes, if they occur, are likely to be pretty gradual here, uh, given the storm structure. And keep in mind that the big change that this weakening of the maximum winds has induced is that the area of strong winds near hurricane force has enlarged over the last day or two. And so the storm now has a larger footprint, and it doesn't take the eye getting quite as close to the coast to bring those hurricane force winds close to shore. And so we could see in these hurricane warning areas along the Florida coastline potential for hurricane force winds gusts at some point tomorrow once the eye makes its closest approach to the coast. And speaking of the track, here's the water vapor loop of the northwest Atlantic showing the storm in here. And our ridge to the east, as we've uh, talked about, is steering this now toward the north. And here's this trough digging into the northeastern Gulf of Mexico. This is the trough that helped weaken this ridge in the first place and is allowing the storm the alleyway northward. One little tweak that's happened in the last day, day and a half, is that this storm is about 6 to 12 hours delayed from what it was expected to be a few days ago on its journey north. It was supposed to be a little bit ahead of schedule right about now. As it stands, it's a little behind schedule. So this trough has had a chance to dig into the northeastern gulf while the storm is still down here. And for that reason, it might try to pivot the storm just a little bit more toward the North Florida and Georgia coastlines. And we've seen a trend for that pivoting around this trough uh, before making that sharp turn along the Carolina coastline. And we're seeing some of that reflected in the European Ensemble guidance today, which has come farther left, showing this really trying to come in tight here. And the 18Z operational European model, which I cannot show you, is kind of on the left side of this, really hugging the coast and then coming up the Carolinas on its way northeastward. And this kind of track would be concerning for even as far south as the areas of Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Daytona Beach. If you have a storm sitting only a couple dozen miles offshore, we could see the potential for strong winds and surge to really be a problem uh, between Daytona Beach and Savannah, Georgia, perhaps a little bit more than was forecast yesterday. Uh, so we'll keep a close eye on that to see which side of this envelope the storm ends up on. If it drifts a little more to the right, better for Georgia and North Florida. But as it stands, there's some indication it might try to really tuck in here. And we're going to have to keep an eye on that because, again, this core wind field is pretty large. So you tuck it up in here, and we could have a pretty nasty day coming tomorrow for North Florida and Georgia. Here is the official forecast track, not quite as far left as that European run I mentioned, but you can see it coming uh, on this general path just east of Florida and Georgia. We have hurricane warnings still along the for Florida coastline, given the potential for hurricane force wind gusts at some point tonight and tomorrow. Hurricane watches for Jacksonville and most of Georgia, and then hurricane warnings for all of the South Carolina coast, all the way past uh, Cape Fear in North Carolina which will start seeing the impacts on Thursday. It's about Thursday, mor sorry, Thursday morning when we'll start seeing South Carolina 
getting under the area of influence here, and then hurricane watches for Cape Hatteras as we're still uh, more than a day and a half away from seeing impacts uh, potentially arriving there. You can see this wind field in orange has expanded as we discussed. Hurricane force wind field is in darker orange, and so you can see there's a large area of tropical storm force winds. does not take much to get these to come onto the coastline, and while these are not necessarily threats to structures like houses, they of course can cause power outages, which is one of the main problems if you have a large wind field like this. The fact that the wind field is large also means it's pushing a lot of water. Large hurricanes push more water than small ones, and we're talking about storm surge warnings across most of this section of coastline and watches farther north. All of these areas are going to see the potential for storm surge flooding of several feet above normally dry ground. Consult your local uh, NWS products and the NHC surge product to see exactly what is expected. And if you live in an evacuation zone and have received an order to leave, please heed it. They tell you to go for a reason. Flooding is uh, pretty easy to generate in the southeastern US. And we're also going to worry a little bit about freshwater flooding, especially if the storm tracks a little bit tighter to the coastline or over the coast. We're talking about the potential for inland rainfall. Keep in mind that storms that come up the eastern seaboard tend to have pretty beefy northwestern sides so if the storm is here it is going to be this side of the storm that is nasty, wet, and windy. And one of the reasons that is, is storms moving northward up the eastern seaboard generally have colder air to their left. And so if there's cold air here, the air coming around the eastern and northern side of the storm is getting lifted up by that cold air, and we get a stronger northwest side of the storm than southeast side. This is why flooding is often a problem with hurricanes that come up the coast, and this one should be no different. We're already starting to see the western side of the storm get a little bit better defined as it starts to tap some uh, warm ocean fluxes off of the Gulf Stream, which is now positioned north of the storm. This part of the airflow is picking up moisture and starting to beefen up this western side. So that's going to be the side facing land and the side to be concerned about going forward. We can see some of the wind speed probabilities from NHC really quick. This is for hurricane force, showing that uh, probabilities along the coast on the current track are about 20-30% over most of this coastline and very low inland. It's unlikely that hurricane force winds would penetrate much uh, from the coastline, given that the track is expected to be close to or just offshore of the coast right now. But of course, a closer track to the coastline would increase these odds. Here's the tropical storm force probabilities uh, over 40 miles an hour, showing a near certainty along the Florida coastline or immediate to the coastline, decreasing as you get inland. But again, power outages are the main concern uh, with these kinds of winds inland. And uh, again, pretty high probabilities above 30 to 50 percent over most of the uh, southeastern portion of Georgia and South and North Carolina. So again, the main message tonight is that the storm is now moving and is expected to kind of tuck itself all along the southeast U.S. coast and it could get much closer to the Carolina coastline than it has to the Florida coastline and we could see a landfall flooding the primary concern from both ocean and fresh water as rain comes down, although thankfully the storm will be speeding up as it moves by the Carolinas, making fresh water flooding perhaps less of an issue than a slow moving storm like Florence last year, but it could still occur. So be aware for that. Strong winds over hurricane force are possible all along these coastlines, maximized along the Carolina coastline as that's where the eye will be closest, but we could see isolated gusts to hurricane force along the North Florida and Georgia coastlines tonight and tomorrow as well. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. Typical update. Here's the latest advisory. Look from above. The latest forecast track. air on the outside of the eye not only goes up but also goes out and so you wind up looking like a football stadium right with all those uh, seats around that center and in this case the center is the sinking air in the center of Dorian 
Thank you for staying with us for our special around the clock live coverage of Hurricane Dorian. I'm meteorologist Mark Elliott, joined in the lab tonight by hurricane expert Dr. Rick Knapp. Dorian continues to clobber the Northwest Bahamas tonight. Uh, we are waiting for that storm to make the all too critical turn north. Right now, the movement is stationary. So here in the lab, we're breaking down the latest model guidance as it comes in tonight. It's a wait and see game still, and it's a game of inches. Want to go to meteorologist Mike Seidel. He's in Indiana Harbor Beach uh, in Florida tonight. And Mike, it is still so close, too close for comfort, as you know, a wobble just a little bit further west puts so many more people in jeopardy with this storm. Uh, indeed, right now, if we go with the track, though, we're hoping for the best. Uh, the winds are running right almost down the beach. Now, remember the beach here doesn't go north-south. It slants a little bit to the west here on the Space Coast. So our winds are out of the north, even though there's a bit of an onshore component. And we'll talk to Dr. Nab in a minute about the winds tomorrow and tomorrow night. Sea foam, surf, look at the surf out here. Boy, we've been here since last Thursday. And each day it gets a little higher and higher. The swell coming in uh, Friday night and Saturday, those are the waves propagating away from Dorian. And now with Dorian about 140 miles or so off to our southeast here, uh, it will get a little bit closer and then it's supposed to track north. So as that happens, we'll start getting some of the rain bands. We've had some outer rain bands. You can see one here. Shot this in the parking lot. This is right off I-95 in Melbourne. So we're a good seven, six, seven miles inland, but it came all over the beaches and inland. And that's the one that gusted to 41 miles an hour. But tomorrow, the bands will become certainly stronger and they'll happen more frequently. I don't think we're going to have a continuous uh, tropical rainstorm because the center at this point is going to stay off the coast. But there's going to be a lot of rain. We're looking at uh, four to eight inches of rain. We've had six tenths of an inch so far. So we could have some localized flooding. But the big impacts by far will be out on the beaches. We're expecting winds gusting up to hurricane force, 70, even 75 miles an hour, hurricane force, 74 miles an hour. And the surge is going to eat away at these beaches. High tide, 1110 Eastern. And already we've had a cut here in this dune, which is a very extensive dune, which is great for the uh, protection. Dr. Nett, I wanted to ask you, because with the storm going north of us, tomorrow when we have the strongest winds, they're going to be blowing out of the north, maybe north-northwest, which is either parallel or a bit offshore. So that should help us a little bit on the surge. But what about the intercoastal? How does that affect the water uh, on the other side of these barrier islands? Because I have a sense it's going to pile up somewhere. Yeah, yeah, the strongest uh, surge and uh, the highest waves would be when you when you have the north side of the hurricane uh, pointing toward the coastline. But then, yes, as it passes uh, by to the north, then you'll have an alongshore current, which makes the ocean conditions at the beach still very dangerous. And then you could uh, have some uh, push of the water into the coast farther north and that can come down some of the intercoastal waterways and still keep water levels high. So not until this really departs Florida will the water levels and the ocean conditions get back to where they are safe. Uh, max winds at 140 miles an hour. We have an Air Force plane in on the way uh, over the next couple of hours. We should have updated data from inside uh, the eye of this stationary major hurricane over a populated area, Freeport in the Bahamas. This is the worst kind of hurricane scenario when a major sits over a low-lying populated area. Hurricane warnings all the way from uh, Martin County up to uh, Ponte Vedra Beach. So where, where Mike Seidel is, that's a hurricane warning in uh, many places up and down the coastline. Not necessarily because we are expecting a landfall of the center of the hurricane, but because it will come close enough that we're expecting hurricane conditions somewhere in that warning area. And we are now oh, about 24 hours or so away from the winds of tropical storm force arriving, say, in the Daytona Beach area, and then 36 hours away from uh, near the uh, Georgia-Florida line. That's where the warnings go up to about that point now. Here it is, uh, centered over Grand Bahama, and you've got some of the outer bands starting to come on shore, maybe some tropical storm force winds in Palm Beach County, uh, as we saw earlier today. Uh, could happen overnight tonight. Here's the forecast track, and it, it is so important to emphasize that we still have an outside chance of landfall, but even if we don't, we could have tracks that are so close to the coast that it could produce some very dangerous conditions. And what this graphic doesn't show you is how large 
the hurricane will be getting as it comes closer to Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas. We have more team coverage this water combined in places like Charleston and Hampton Roads. That's becoming a concern. And it's so important to emphasize that Dorian has become bit larger and will probably get larger still mm. and larger hurricanes even when they're not cat three four or five can push the ocean around and the analogy i like to use is if you have a small intense hurricane it's like sticking your finger in the water and going around in fast circles you're not going to push the water around but if you stand with your arms outstretched and then you move them around you're going to push water around a lot more easily even if your arms aren't moving as fast as your little it's, circle it's, with your finger. You know, it was the last weekend of summer, unofficially, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, you picture the little kid trying to splash the parent at the pool, yeah. and they're just, like, using their hands super fast, and then the parent eventually gets, you know, wise about it, and just the, the tidal yeah. wave goes over the kid. You've seen that before. The, that's what this storm could do, right, with the yeah. big... Uh, big eye moving a bunch of water towards the land. And that's what storm surge is. It's the winds of the hurricane pushing the water toward the coastline and flooding normally dry ground. So even if you don't get landfall of the center, you can get devastating storm surge and wave action. And you know, the Matthew track was kind of like this and we could be seeing some similar impacts and that was a devastating hit on the coast of South Carolina, Georgia, and North Carolina as well. So we have to focus on the river systems, right? Because they're going to be backing up. We have to focus on the, where these winds come in and there could be some wind damage and those winds then push the water back up the rivers as well. Yeah, and with a perfect forecast, the size of the wind field will almost ensure hurricane conditions along the coastal areas of the Carolinas. Anything farther left just amplifies the onshore flow and when you get up into here, you get onshore flow from the east. And you got to get ready before the winds of tropical storm force arrive. You got to finish evacuating. Some of the coastal emergency managers, including just recently in Horry County, they're communicating publicly your window to evacuate is starting to shrink because the weather's going to go downhill tomorrow. You got to get out before those winds get in. And that means when those winds come in, the water starts to climb, and it's not. Uh, usually just a, a slow trickle rise. It's more of a, the water's here now. Yeah, and the greatest rise on normally dry ground from saltwater flooding would be in the South Carolina area into portions of North Carolina. Four to seven feet above normally dry ground is expected somewhere in this area. And one of the areas we're concerned about is Charleston. Thursday midday in the early afternoon, that's when we're expecting high tide. And that is about the time frame where the center of the hurricane could be near or over Charleston. So reasonable worst case scenario on parts of that peninsula could get more than six feet mm. above normally dry ground. That is getting up to levels that Charleston experienced with Hugo. So that is a significant call out there. If you remember Hugo in this area, if, if, if we had anywhere close to there, this is going to be one you remember for a very long time. Keep it tuned right here. Our coverage continues right after this. Uh, just southeast of Cape Fear now. And now where Jim is here in the, the Wilmington area down to Cape Fear, you're, you're getting more of a north wind now. So the wind is starting to come off the land, or at least it's following the uh, shoreline. And he didn't quite get into the worst of it, which is right there on the immediate northwest side, that northwestern eye wall. Now, what if you take this and move it very close to Moorhead City, Cape Fear? You could have this really active site actually come on land. So don't take what has happened in Curie Beach as exactly what will happen in other coastal areas farther northeast in North Carolina. They could take uh, a more full brunt of the winds of this. And here's the other thing, up here in eastern North Carolina, get into the sounds, we already have two things going on that is just the be that are just the beginning. You have the onshore push going into the sounds, and that is already going to be starting to pile up the water into the sounds and then up the rivers. It's not you know, a pure landfall type of storm surge yet, but as this makes its way northeastward, the onshore push into the sounds will get stronger. So we still could have a significant storm surge event there in eastern North Carolina and other places along the way. The other thing that is starting is the heavy rainfall. It's very unstable here in the northeastern quadrant of this hurricane, more so than in the northwestern quadrant. You can tell by the lightning. You can tell by how cellular and potent these outer bands are. And so this area of North Carolina is really uh, at risk of having a very significant life-threatening water event, salt water, fresh water, or a combination of the two. And also, we still have an ongoing significant flash flood issue here uh, in 
central to south central North Carolina. Just to give you an idea, this is a recently extended flash flood warning that includes uh, major portions of Duplin and Onslow counties. Uh, this includes Jacksonville and Half Moon. This goes till 6.15 in the morning and you could have over a foot of rain uh, come down in some of these spots. And here's our northernmost flash flood warning that goes until 3.30 in the morning. And as that gentleman from the Department of Transportation mentioned a little bit ago, it gets more and more dangerous for people to be on the roads at night. So got to stay off the roads and, and, and make sure you don't end up driving to your death. It's too many people died that way in Hurricane Matthew. Let's take a look around the coastline and let's start in Surfside, which is north of where uh, Jim is. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Surfside Beach, South Carolina. So this would have been earlier. Uh, we'll go to Surf City later. That's on the North Carolina coast. This is Surfside Beach, South Carolina. And this was storm surge flooding that uh, resulted from the onshore push as the center of Dorian was passing just offshore of Charleston and then just offshore of Myrtle Beach. The Surfside Beach lies in between uh, those two locations. And that water is moving and that water is not shallow. So these folks are taking a bit of a risk being in their vehicles. You don't want to do this. And um, let's go farther north up to Myrtle Beach, North Carolina. This was also an area that uh, took the western or northwestern side of the circulation and quite a bit of uh, impact on the dunes and on the beaches and, and this might have been the result of someone trying to drive uh, down the beach and they ran into some debris and it is uh, you know softer sand when it's completely soaked under the ocean for quite some time and some of this water in the Myrtle Beach area got onto uh, some of the streets you know, they had storm surge getting into uh, some of the communities there and so it was a good thing that people were off the roads and, and heeding those evacuation instructions. Not just of water, but wind and the wind associated with tornadoes. Look at this tornado damage in Brunswick County, North Carolina. This was much earlier today in the outer bands of the hurricane. This was not as a result of the core of the hurricane going near or overhead. These were tornadoes which are very common in the outer bands of landfalling or near landfalling hurricanes. Quite a bit of damage there. It looks like a, a lot of damage to the trees and fences, but maybe not as much to the homes. And then here, uh, we might be saying goodbye to this car. Uh, at least a very expensive repair if you could get it out of the water. Turn around, don't drown applies to salt water as much as it does fresh water. Jim and I will be back in just a moment. More coverage of Dorian. There, didn't get a little rest and be back out in the morning uh, when uh, maybe the uh, worst of it starts hitting the Charleston area. I mean, really, in Charleston, with the shape of the coast there and all of that water, the storm surge coming, the heavy rain coming, coinciding with the time of high tide, what do you anticipate? Uh, they're really worried about uh, that combination, and uh, so we're going to see uh, this area floods a lot. Uh, normally, it's why they call it the low country, but uh, they're really worried with that combination. And then, uh, obviously, we're also dealing with the heavy rain. Uh, we could have some flash flooding in areas that uh, don't normally flood from the tidal floods that they deal with. So they're getting in a lot of different uh, things. I just talked to one of the sergeants with the uh, Charleston Police Department, and as of yet, they're not really dealing with uh, any trees down, power lines down, any of that stuff at the moment. But as we said, with the tide, we think that's going to deteriorate here in the next hour, hour and a half. Yeah, and also shelters. Have you talked to anyone, people heading to shelters? They were kind of advising people to do that. Uh, there are some people. I did run across one couple out uh, on one of the barrier islands that had planned to uh, ride it out in the home, and uh, uh, they finally decided, no, they were going to uh, uh, go inland and, and seek shelter. So uh, many people are trying to figure out what to do, but uh, realizing uh, this has the potential to be worse than they maybe thought it was initially, and so uh, they're trying to, to make preparations. And, and again, as you've seen here on a major four-lane highway that, that I'm sitting uh, by, you know, except for a police officer that came by, that's the only traffic that we've had here. All right, Charles Peak, our storm tracker, joining us live from Charleston. Thank you so much. Things will only deteriorate for you tomorrow with 50 to 70 mile per hour wind gusts. And of course, the wall of water will be watching. Thank you, Charles. All right, now we'll go to Felicia Combs live in Savannah to talk about the conditions there. All right, good evening to you. Talk about what you've seen in the changes over the last hour. Hey, Alexandra. So in the past hour or 
so things have been, uh, you know, kind of how they have been for the past few hours. We've had a steady light rain. At times the rain is a little bit heavier. We've also had a steady breeze, but at times it's been a bit gustier. The uh, We have had tropical storm force wind gusts here reported in Savannah, and uh, that was part of the forecast. You can see the trees kind of blowing around behind me a bit. You can kind of make out the rain falling there as well. We're here on River Street, which is, uh, you know, one of the more popular spots in Savannah. A lot of people would typically be out, but we are under a mandatory evacuation and also a curfew here in Savannah. Now, I did have a few people asking me about Tybee Island, if we have the latest on Tybee Island. Uh, we did get some reports of tropical storm force winds there. Uh, the biggest worry for Tybee Island is going to be overnight tonight during that second overnight high tide. So around 2 a.m., that's when they're expecting the conditions to be uh, maybe the worst for the possibility of some storm surge flooding around Tybee Island. So uh, really going to ebb and flow with those tides. Of course, Dorian just off uh, sh offshore, so uh, we're still feeling those impacts here in the Savannah area. The worst conditions will be overnight and into early Thursday morning, and then we'll start to see conditions improving slowly on Thursday as Dorian is pulling away. You can kind of tell uh, the wind is gusting here or there in Savannah, and of course, we'll be keeping an eye on it for you as Dorian pulls away toward the Carolinas. Um, September 5th, 2019, and those are Hurricane Dorian clouds. Dorian clouds. Hurricane Dorian. We're not going to get much of the storm. These are the outer bands that are over, which right now ain't producing any rain at all. But, yeah, that's it. That's Dorian. Nice day today, 80 degrees, breezy, and pretty nice. Is north of Charleston. Charleston getting in on the heavy rain now. Myrtle's Inlet, Myrtle Beach, you won't be far behind, and you've got to be off the roads, taking shelter as instructed by local officials because the conditions will be going downhill and they're going to be life threatening. And this is a very serious storm that is going to produce wind and water at the coast and inland uh, that could take lives if we don't take this seriously. It went from 110 miles an hour to 115 at the 11 p.m. Eastern Time Advisory. That brought it up to Category 3, moving north at 7 miles an hour, and it's about to take uh, the right-hand turn that's going to take it very close to, if not directly over, the coastline of North Carolina. Probably the center doesn't come ashore in South Carolina, but that's really just academic at this point. We know it is close enough, strong enough, and large enough to uh, to bring the hurricane conditions, the storm surge, and the rain-induced flooding to the South Carolina coast starting tonight and the North Carolina coastal areas uh, tomorrow into Friday. And this won't just, won't just be a coastal event. It's not going to be coming ashore and stalling like Florence did last year. It's going to be behaving a little bit more like Matthew did in 2016. It's not going to take the exact same track and it might have rain and flooding and other impacts in slightly different places, but this is going to be potentially just as strong, if not a little stronger than Matthew when it follows this track paralleling the coast. So don't dismiss this just because it's not barreling straight inland, and don't focus too much and obsess over landfall of the center because it's already going to be a life-threatening storm. The winds are coming southwest to northeast, Tropical storm conditions will be uh, pers you know, uh, making their way up the South Carolina coast and by breakfast time arriving uh, at the South Carolina and North Carolina border. And then as the day goes on tomorrow, make their way into North Carolina. So your preparations have got to be rushed to completion in North Carolina tomorrow. Things will start to get bad as the day goes on. In South Carolina, it's already time to be sheltering and be staying off the roads. The latest advisory shows the chances of sustained winds of tropical storm force have gone up farther inland. So this could be quite an extensive wind event in the coastal areas, but not just right at the beachfront. And the chances of sustained hurricane force winds are pretty high at some of these coastal locations. They will increase in North Carolina. Uh, hurricane conditions will be uh, much less likely uh, farther inland, but 
Uh, strong enough winds to take out the power in many places, likely some widespread power outages, and we've got to take that hazard very seriously. It's surprising sometimes how uh, dangerous and uh, sometimes deadly power outages can be. Don't light candles inside. Don't run those generators inside either. Let's take a look at some new video. We know this storm has the potential to bring widespread, devastating inland flooding, and we saw this kind of flooding in Hurricane Matthew in 2016. The Grifton and Kinston areas in North Carolina were underwater after Matthew. So that is one of the hazards that we have got to uh, learn from, from because remember that Matthew took 26 lives due to inland from those faith these were vehicles and a good number of the people over barricade. If we stay off of covered road, we can get that faith be known to zero. It's due uh, the rainfall in the fall very heavily in Austin. This area we are very concerned about a few hours. Good fall rates next week. Uh, would nice if we see a flutter of warnings on too much longer. And this is on the maps getting a rainfall. And as system northeast will start to uh, materialize. But as if you're some training in Carolina. Uh, so let's take a look at the where we're flooding. And when we get to tomorrow, flood risk re ramps. This thick is Basin Center. They're high air. The eye of Hurricane Dorian getting as close to the continental United States as it ever has, just off the coast of Cape Fear, and right nearby there is Southport, North Carolina, just catching the northwestern eye wall. Looks like they've got some downed trees there. Uh, the heavy rain has let up a little bit, but it's going to be raining all night. There's a flash flood warning in effect for this entire area all night long. So we still have the risk of some downed trees and some flooded roads. Dangerous night to be out on the roads and need to be listening to those instructions from local officials. Don't go back into uh, evacuated areas until told to do so. And this is one of the hazards that you could deal with. Sometimes trees fall onto the roads and then people get out on the roads at night. You can't see far down the road and they run into trees. People have died that way. So, so many reasons to be staying off the roads. And where our Jim Cantori is in Curie Beach, just a little bit north of Southport. Uh, Jim, you just missed the northwestern eye wall, but yeah. you uh, are, are going to have a long night of uh, heavy rainfall. And it's important to note that folks up the coast, up in Moorhead City, Cape Lookout, they might actually catch that northwestern eye wall. They might, and and you know I don't know what uh, what you're looking at on radar there, but th what'll be really interesting to look at is the Moorhead City radar, and you'll be able to see pretty well in in the base velocity what kind of winds are up at a certain height. The big question is, can you get some semblance of that wind down to the ground? And the be best way to do that is in the rain bands, frankly. Uh, so so we'll see. And and you know, Doctor Nath, there's, there's always a chance that. Uh, we do get part of this eye wall on shore there in Moorhead City because it's quite a turnout. I mean, you literally go up and then turn due east <laughs> to go out to Moorhead City, Atlantic Beach, uh, and that Emerald Isle area. So, uh, you know, it's going to have a much better chance of dealing with that eye wall uh, than we did. So we just got into it uh, around 8, 9 o'clock tonight. The band has shifted back uh, to our east. So for Curry in Carolina, I think what you see is what you get for the next several hours. Gradually, the winds will go north and then northwest as the storm pulls to our north, and then we will see a gradual winding down of the rain uh, as we go through tomorrow. Now, this is going to be great news for Wrightsville. This is going to be great news, obviously, for Carolina and Curry as uh, officials will get out at first light tomorrow. They will assess the beaches and everything else, and they will tell you whether you can go, you know, they can lift the curfew and people can get back out and about. Businesses can reopen and things like that. That's really how the system works. But, uh, you know, when, you, when you're when you playing with a, a jog east or west, makes all the difference in the world, whether you get 65 miles an hour or 85 to 90 miles per hour. And that's still as possible as Dr. Knapp uh, was talking about it through here. And again, guys, we lost power at about 610 this evening. Um, I hear generators off uh, to my distance, and a lot of these homes, from what I understand from some of the neighbors, actually do have their own generators. So there are some lights on, some are not. A lot of these are vacation homes where people come in, obviously, for certain uh, weeks of the year uh, in, in vacation. The other thing we're going to have to watch, too, is the high tide. 
which comes up after 2 o'clock tonight. Uh, you know, how much wave action is left there, even though we won't maximize the storm surge, because now we'll be a little bit, I think, north-northwest in terms of the wind component, there will still obviously be water rise because of the tide. The tides are going to happen anyway. They happen every day, regardless of, of what's happening with the weather. It's just the weather adds a certain component to their height, uh, higher or lower, depending on certainly uh, what's happening with it, winds onshore, offshore, pressure, things like that, storminess. And, you know, about 100 yards to my east, uh, is where that ocean is. They just did a huge beach renourishment project down here, both Carolina and Curry. It was about $17 million. Uh, I walked down those, you know, toward those dunes today. Beautiful dunes. They're set back. They're high. They're like 10 feet up. We're at 13 feet, by the way. So that's why we stayed here. We knew we weren't going to get into the storm surge at all. But they held up beautifully today. So hopefully they'll be just as well uh, tonight. Again, occasionally gusting 50, 60. We're sustained at 30, even lower than that uh, at times. But I think, you know, some of the worst weather we've already surpassed. And now, as you said, Dr. Knapp, just expecting kind of a rainy night here uh, in at least southeastern North Carolina. But off to the north, conditions will certainly worsen. Uh, Doc, I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you make of this pressure? This is, this is a pretty low pressure for what is barely, a, you know, a Category 2 hurricane. Well, a lot of former major hurricanes have done this. You know, when, when Hurricane Ike came ashore, for example, as a Category 2 hurricane in the northwestern Gulf uh, into Texas, a Category 2, it was a 950 right. millibar pressure. So these large former major wow. hurricanes tend to be in the 950s even when they are Category 2. And if we see, uh, if we see this landfall, let's just say this landfalls as a as a sub 960. Uh, that that's that puts that in pretty pretty decent company uh, for North Carolina hurricanes, doesn't it? it? It does. And what it means is, if so, if you've got Category Two, but you've got that low of a pressure somewhere along the way, that means this is a large hurricane that's going to produce some storm surge somewhere. I don't see how we get out of that, and I think the greatest chance of that happening is going to be in the sounds and up the rivers uh, yes. in eastern North yes. Carolina. Yep. Yeah, and of course you get the ocean side first, and, with, and, I, and I've seen this happen, so it's, it's crazy, and I can tell you about it, for Albemarle and, and Pamlico Sounds to watch that water get pushed uh, back up the river, all right, with the east wind, and then when the storm goes to the north, it, it, it's when you get the worst conditions on places like Hatteras Island because all that water comes back down over the highway, uh, all right, from the sound side. So it's an amazing thing, and you'll have to deal with that, unfortunately, tomorrow in the Outer Banks. We'll be right back. Atlantic and the Pacific. Uh, right now, lots of activity. Uh, we do have uh, Hurricane Juliet out in the Pacific. We also have Hurricane Dorian, of course. Tropical Storm Gabrielle now, an area to watch right here. And then this one right here, I'm going to highlight this one in red. That one's something to really keep a close eye on. Invest 94L. Uh, something to keep a close eye on as we get through the next several days. All right, more on Hurricane Dorian. Right now, still a Category 1 hurricane. 90 mile per hour winds associated with it. We should be getting the latest uh, assessment in just a few minutes, uh, but right now still moving in northeast at 14 miles per hour. It's still the made landfall earlier this morning at 835 a.m. this morning at Hatteras. And in fact, we still have a flash flood emergency in place for the Outer Banks. It's in effect until noon p.m. noon the, the today at Eastern Time for Ocracoke, Hatteras. You're all embedded in here. A lot of water has come up. I mean, storm surge, we're talking about five and a half feet of water above dry ground in these areas. And unfortunately, we're still seeing this dire situation. If you are listening to my voice, you need to seek higher levels of your home right now immediately. And the National Weather Service in Moorhead City has tweeted out that they are expecting that water level to inundate the first levels of many homes across these islands. So uh, it's still a dangerous situation that we're watching as we zoom in here. This isn't coming from the ocean. It's not coming from the seaside. It's actually coming from the sound side. We're looking at right here, Pamlico Sound embedded all right in here. And you can see that water pushing in thanks to that wind reversal, that wind uh, pushing in from Hurricane Dorian. Notice it's wrapping around like that. Winds all across the re region, even well inland. We're still seeing impacts. Fayetteville, 25 mile per hour wind gusts reported for you. Raleigh, Durham at 23 and 37 in Wilmington. So we will continue to see this uh, gradually subside as we get through the late later this evening, Tevin, uh, but we still have several more hours to be dealing with the lashing that Dorian still has for the Mid-Atlantic. Seems to be an endless novel by the name of Dorian. We are still dealing with another chapter here in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and in the Mid-Atlantic. I'm meteorologist Tevin Wooten as we bring you continuing coverage here on the Weather Channel of Hurricane Dorian. Today, Dorian's wind energy being materialized along the Atlantic coast here in Virginia Beach and through portions of Hampton Roads and Norfolk as well. We do 
show you how much fury is coming in right now with an angry Atlantic. The flow coming in predominantly from the east, but occasionally we do get some flow from the northeast. And that is actually churning up this Atlantic right now. Some of the strongest winds gust near 70 miles per hour. That was measured near the Chesapeake Lighthouse about 14 miles away. Granted, that is over open ocean, but still a lot of wind coming along with this storm. You can see how the waves are crashing in. And crash in. They also sort of curl over and actually move a little bit from the uh, left side of your screen towards the right side of your screen because of the strong winds coming in right now. We've also got sand being picked up. Now the good news is in terms of tide, it actually doesn't appear to be that bad. Now high tide is closer to 2.30, so we have to monitor very closely, especially for some of the lower lying areas uh, into the Chesapeake and the southern tip of the Chesapeake and near the Hampton Road area as well. We do have a flash flood warning for the water, not the water from the ground, but the water falling from the sky until 3.30 this afternoon for Virginia Beach. The National Weather Service issued that earlier today, and they issued it for the full extent of time that they could, six hours, because they are anticipating flooding here, not just from the water falling from the sky, but of course it starts to fall into the ground and pile up. As that water piles up, it's got to funnel somewhere, but it can't really funnel out to the Atlantic like it typically would because of that onshore push of very strong winds, gusty winds today, surpassing tropical storm force closer to 55 miles per hour for some of the strongest gusts, and we're still not done just yet. Now, I do think closer to midday today and right around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, we start to see the rain lesson here in Virginia Beach, and then the water, it should be allowed as Dorian Center passes off to the north and east that water should be allowed to kind of flow back out. But if you live on the northern side of some of the inlets here, like Norfolk, if you live north of the main downtown area, you get that offshore push of winds, and then that actually brings the water out. And as the water starts to flow out because the winds are so strong, we may see some convergence of that water and the potential for, for flooding here in the state of Virginia and in southeastern Virginia. Right now, I'll show you we're still dealing with a lot of heavy rainfall and wind as well. We've gotten closer to two inches of rain today from Dorian. Again, the strongest winds though, 50 or 55 miles per hour. Occasionally you get a gust. It's very difficult to stand up at times just like this because the winds are so strong. Let's go inside now to meteorologist Liana Brackett. She's got more on Dorian. Yeah, and Tevin, I mean, that wind has just been relentless with you uh, the past two and a half hours. We'll touch back in with you in just a bit. But first, we want to get you caught up on what we know right now with Hurricane Dorian. More than 400,000 people are without power in the Carolina and Southeast Virginia areas. South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster has lifted the evacuation orders that were in effect. And North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper held a press conference last hour reporting that people are trapped on Ocracoke Island due to storm surge. Now, the Outer Banks, you've taken the worst of Dorian, especially Hatteras, where Dorian made landfall this morning. New video into the Weather Channel from Frisco, North Carolina. Take a look at this. On the left-hand side of your screen, that's the video. Hatteras has seen some of the intense gusts, the most intense gusts, and also, unfortunately, the storm surge. Unfortunately, you're dealing with major power outages, trees down. Over 230,000 people in North Carolina are without power this morning. Also, Hatteras Island. Take a look at this. You can see the wind still just, ooh, oh, that was pretty violent. Look how it's just whipping these poor tree limbs around. You can see the water out in the distance. Can't make out if that's a road or not, but you can see uh, just major impacts along the Outer Banks. In fact, we still have a uh, flash flood emergency still in place for you. All right, let's take a look at another video for you. All right, this again, looking at Hatteras, North Carolina, wind whipping these trees around violently. And then you can see, you know, it's bad when you can see the, the rain blowing sideways at times. And that's what you can see. You're looking on the live side, on the right hand side, the frying pan shoals, you've just been being whipped around that uh, American
Dorian's life just getting ripped to shreds all thanks to Hurricane Dorian as it continues to its trek northeast. Latest advisory from the National Hurricane Center still keeps it at a category one, still has the winds at 90 miles per hour. However, the speed has changed. It's actually picked up a little bit more momentum, 17 mile per hour movement going into the northeast and it is now 50 miles northeast of Cape Hatteras. So it did make landfall at 8.35 a.m. this morning Eastern time at Hatteras. And uh, as we take a look, let's go ahead and put it in motion of that landfall. It happened this morning. So it made landfall as a category one with winds at 90 miles per hour, similar to what it is now. And the pressure was at 956 millibars. So visible satellite imagery showing the eye right here. Uh, you can still see some uh, convection bubbling up around it just a bit, but really we're going to see the wind, the rain, the flash flood threat still lingering and storm surge threat still lingering over the next several hours, even as the eye moves way offshore into the northeast. We're getting whipped around across the mid-Atlantic thanks to that overall flow, that wind reversal that we saw. Uh, now, we're, as we zoom in into this flash flood emergency for the Outer Banks, it's really the sound side that we're looking at bringing all that water in. In fact, we had five and a half foot storm surge that's above dry ground, five and a half feet of water above dry ground uh, happening across Ocracoke Island. Uh, so this, uh, this advisory, this emergency is still in effect until noon today for parts of Dare and Hyde counties. As we take a look, there's that sound side motion of that water that I was just discussing. And unfortunately, as we uh, take a look at this tidal gauge, I mean, it was extremely impressive. It has since crested, we believe, but in fact, uh, this is the second time, this is the second highest level that we've ever seen in the past nine years since records were being taken at this gauge since 2010. Uh, second highest since Hurricane Matthew. The first one was Hurricane Matthew. This is the second highest now. 6.37 feet, that's the latest. The previous, uh, you can see it just shot up from one foot up to six feet in an, about an hour. So it was just a major push of water pushing on, on shore. Uh, we also have the flash flood warning in place for parts of Virginia Beach, Norfolk, and Chesapeake, and that's where we want to send it back out to Tevin Wooden, who is live in Virginia Beach. Hey, Tevin. Yeah, Liana, we do have that flash flood warning, so water will rise very quickly in terms of ponding on the roadways and the potential for some inland flooding as well coming along with Hurricane Dorian. The wind, they are also strong today, and they have been strong over the past three or four hours. In fact, when I went to bed last night, I heard a slight whistle coming through the cracks and the crevices throughout the hotel, and then this morning I woke up and I knew what was outside. I knew what was on the other side of that door by the name of Dorian. That is what was lurking on the other side, and Dorian is still here, even though the center of the storm is offshore by about 100 miles or so. We're getting those outer bands, but also the core of the, strong, the storm, too, as well. Wow. Excuse me. We're still getting some of the strong winds, and that has really been the case. I mean, I don't think we've seen winds less than 20 or 25 miles per hour since about midnight. Some of the strongest gusts, though, again, start passing tropical storm force. And uh, speaking of winds, the Chesapeake Bay, Bridge, Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, the CBBT as it's known around here, one of the many tunnels they have throughout Virginia and Virginia Beach, right along Highway 13. Uh, you actually have to monitor that very closely if you're driving a high-profile vehicle because of the strong winds coming through. They are operating, or were operating, rather, about 30 or 45 minutes or so at a level 4. That means they are seeing winds in excess of 60 miles per hour. So for those traveling, hopefully in low trial vehicles, well, actually, hopefully no one's traveling, but if you are in a car and you're going through that tunnel, you're going slowly because they advise travel close to 45 miles per hour for the maximum speed. The winds, though, they are 60 miles an hour or surpassing that near the Chesapeake Bay Lighthouse. That lighthouse actually saw winds closer to 73 miles per hour. That was a storm report at about 7.15 this morning. So several hours ago, you can sort of see how this long-duration wind event starts to add up in terms of not just down trees or power lines, but also storm surge and inland flooding. A lot of waterways throughout uh, Virginia Beach and Newport and Hampton Roads. And as that water comes in with the onshore push of winds, Liana, that actually saw a cause of some of those waterways and channels to clog up, and they can't drain out. And that, my friends, leads to inland flooding and storm surge, Liana. Yeah, Tevin, I mean, we're expecting that flash flood threat to be with us even through the late evening hours and even lasting into tomorrow morning. So uh, thanks so much for that report, and we'll get back into you.
to you within just a moment. Uh, but we want to bring in now on the phone Beth Baker. She's the Director of Public Affairs for the Navy Mid-Atlantic Region. And Beth, we're learning three ships had to move because of the storm. Can you elaborate? That's right. Well, we sortied the fleet from Norfolk, Virginia um, earlier this week. <laughs> We had three littorial combat ships that had to get out of Norfolk and head up north to our sub-base in New London. Um, they are actually Mayport-based ships that left Mayport for the hurricane, came to Norfolk for safe haven, and then when the hurricane took a turn here to the area and the fleet commander sorted the fleet, those ships had to then go to um, sub-base New London. So the Sioux City arrived this morning, and the USS Milwaukee and USS Billings will arrive in Groton, Connecticut at our great sub-base there later today around 11.30 and then 1.30. So uh, they're seeking safe haven all the way from Mayport once again. Wow. wow. So, I mean, was there any damage reported associated with this, uh, the storm? Uh, nothing to our ships.